every prophet. Uh, Samuel's not in there, and David's not in there. But uh, Elijah and Elisha, and then from Isaiah to Malachi, and we talked about they were a prophet to either the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, and gave you some dates about that. And then last week, I covered some things, uh, things about the, the fifth course of punishment prophets, Isaiah to Malachi. Uh, they're on your handout sheet today. Those seven major doctrinal issues, and the things that are in red there, uh, those are things that... Normally, you would not have gotten in that. Those are just notes that I kind of have for myself to be able to look at. And I just thought, I'm just going to include those and let you have those as well. Uh, the, the two parts to the days of the Messiah are listed there on the back. Uh, our twofold commission, one is to men, that ministry of reconciliation, and the other is to angels, uh, talking about the fellowship of the mystery. And then lastly, I gave you that list of things concerning Israel's commission. So uh, just to kind of make, uh, I, I told you I would bring you all of that because you were trying to write those down. They were on the PowerPoint. So uh, there they are. Uh, and so when we left off this last time, we were talking about the members of the believing remnant of Israel carrying out their commission to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you recall that that gospel was the gospel of the kingdom. If the Gentiles respond positively to that gospel, they will get the same deliverances from the tribulation judgments that the believing remnant will get. And um, so that brings us to this. And this, I, we read this verse, this will pick us right up where we left off. Matthew 16, 17. By the way, all of those commissions at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the first chapter of the book of Acts, those are all Israel's commissions. And there's an element of that, we'll talk about it, in which they are kingdom commissions. And, and maybe we'll get a chance to, to talk about that. So here we go. Mark, this is one of those gospels, Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now I just want to kind of run through these just for a moment. Signs, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Signs have always been a part of Israel's program from the very beginning. We know that. But the particular signs that are being talked about here, and I'm not going to turn this into a lesson on this. We could, but I want to just say this and move on. But the particular signs that are talked about here have significance to the climactic stage in Israel's program. Let me show you something. You remember I started teaching you about those stages just as a... And aside, as we, as we went along, there was in Genesis, there was the formation stage. And then, remember, we had, I started listing these other stages for you in which um, uh, we talked about, remember, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, uh, being the next one that talked about, that was that, well, that's just the... The Exodus stage in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then remember, uh, then we had the conquest stage, which was the third stage in the program. That was over there in the book of Joshua. And then you remember, we had the, the first course of punishment stage. And that, and that was the fourth stage in Israel's program. Well, now what I want to do is I want to skip you down to the final stage in Israel's program because that, that, I'm going to call it the climactic stage in Israel's program. And even though I'm going to mention this to you again in a moment when we get to it, I want you to understand that when you get to the climactic stage in Israel's program, 95 or 98 percent of everything that's going to happen has happened in the program. But here's what you have. You have the earthly ministry this marker is just running out of gas 
Let me get a different one. You have the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. You have, that's better, the extension of mercy given. Of course, this is recorded in the Gospels. You have the extension of mercy, that one-year extension of mercy given in those first eight chapters of the book of Acts. And then you're going to have this final part over here. That's going to be the, well, let's just call it this. Let's just call it Daniel's 70th week. Now that marker's running out of gas. What's going on with that? So, <clears throat> that climactic stage has three parts to it. And although you know about those parts, I want you to see them as a, a, a part of a whole of that climactic stage in Israel's program. I'm saying that to you because uh, when we get into this, it, when you, we're talking about the signs that he's talking about here, those signs are directly connected to what's happening in the climactic stage. So don't just think about signs generally. I've already said more about it than I ever planned to say about it. So let me stop or I'm going you know, to we'll spend the whole time on that. Casting out devils. In my name they cast out devils. You see that down here. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So when you get to casting out devils and healing the sick, those are the two hallmark signs of the kingdom. Why do I call them that? Why, why do we talk about them that way? Because in the old, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Let me just say it this way. Back in the Old Testament prophets, when they were writing, I'm talking about from Isaiah to Malachi, when they were writing about the kingdom and how great the kingdom was going to be, there was two outstanding things that were being said about the kingdom. Now there's more to it than that, but one thing is all of the unclean spirits were going to be cast out of the land. That was prophesied back in the prophets. And the other thing is there wouldn't be any more sickness or disease. So when Jesus comes, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So you know what he's doing is he is showing these, when I say they're the hallmark signs of the kingdom, in other words, he's saying to prove to you that what I'm preaching about this coming kingdom is true, let me fulfill these two things that you all know the prophet said would be happening in the kingdom. Because in the land of Israel, during his earthly ministry, those, there were unclean spirits everywhere. So he's casting out those unclean spirits and healing the sick. In other words, those things were specifically prophesied about in the Old Testament prophets. And when the kingdom is established on this earth, that is going to be the way that's going to be. Okay, everybody with that? Okay. Now, that's, and so, again, we're not going to say any more than that, but there that is. <sighs> Go back to verse uh, 17. Uh, In my name they'll cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Of course they will. They'll have to. Do you know why? Because, remember... We talked about this last time. There's a progression to the gospel. I showed it to you in Luke, and I showed it to you in Acts. And you remember? Where's the gospel? Go where, when that preaching starts, where is it going to start? Thank you. In Jerusalem. And then Judea. And then Samaria. And then the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's going to start in Jerusalem, 
and it's going to spread out from there. So there's, a, there's an order to it. There's a progression to it. But when you get outside of here and you start getting down to the uttermost parts of the earth, guess what? You're going to have to be able to communicate in the language that the people understand. Of course they're going to speak with new tongues. They're going to be, in fact, the Old Testament prophets talked about how many languages of people were going to have to hear this message from these Jewish evangelists. We're going to read that today. So when you start sending them out, they're going to, it's, see, <laughs> this is crazy. We, I love sci-fi movies. I do. Because when I watch TV, I just want to be entertained. To me, to me, now look, there'll be somebody listening to this, and they're going to get their feelings hurt. And I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. But if I'm going to sit down and watch something, entertainment to me is not watching some family go through all of these hardships where the dad loses his job, and the kid contracts a disease, and... You know, and now the mother has meningitis and everything has fallen apart. That is way too much like real life to me. That does not entertain me. To me, I, I, that's why I love sci-fi. It's so far out there, it's just entertainment. But you know what's funny? Now, I don't know. Did you ever watch Star Trek? And they, they go, you know, where no man has gone before. And they all speak English. <laughs> I mean, doesn't it? Do, huh? They got, a they got a universal translator, so they're translating a language that's never been put into the universal translator. Okay. So I'm just, I, that would be great, wouldn't it? You know what? That's right up there with punching a button on a deal and getting a ribeye steak and a baked potato out of the. You know, whatever that, okay, you know what I mean? Hey, I'm, I'm, if you get one of those, Norma, I want to know about it. Okay. okay. Now, look, here's my point, and I know not everybody in the real world, not everybody speaks English. I meet people today living in Texas who do not speak English. No, <laughs> I know that's a shock. So if you travel to another country and you're going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you're going to have to be able to speak the language that those people... That's what the new tongues is all about. Now there's actually more to it than that, but this is another one of those things I don't want to get tied up into doing the whole lesson on. But there's, there's a coming kingdom and these folks are going to have to know about it. And that's what the Lord intends. He says, when he says, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world. That's Matthew 24. Well, the only way to do that is to be able to communicate to them. What do you think that thing in Acts chapter 2 was about? How hear we every man in the language that we were born in? That was the thing that was going on there. Okay, now, Zechariah talks about People from ten different nations, when they go out to preach that gospel, let me show it to you here. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I'm just trying to show you, these are different languages. It actually mentions it there in that verse. Now, by the way, there is a... Remember last week when I showed you that great conversion that was going on? That those people had witnessed all of that, and when they hear the truth... And remember, they were coming like clouds into the land of Israel. These people had been to worship the king and all of that. Well, listen... When, when these people are going out, this is, this is part of that esteem that the nations of the world were giving the believing remnant as, the, as that nation, that, that holy nation and that royal priesthood. They're catching a hold of these guys and they go, we've heard God is with you, 
Oh, they're wanting to team up with them. And that's what that's about. The entire chapter of Zechariah chapter 8 is talking about the way things are going to be in the kingdom. Take a look with me here. Back up to verse 21. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. In other words, you got all these Gentile cities out there. They're going to be going from one city to the next, saying to each other, Hey, we need to go to Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. And then look at 20, verse 22. Yea, many people in strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Now the point I'm making to you here is that, that gospel in Mark chapter 16. Okay, look, I don't have... It's not in my notes because I thought I'm not going to talk about this. But in Mark chapter 16, that gospel is a kingdom gospel. Remember when I said to you that just a moment ago? This is a kingdom gospel. Look, let me show you something. Jerusalem, Judea, and all that. Let's do this familiar thing. Sea of Galilee, River Jordan, Dead Sea down here. Jerusalem sits right here. This is where it's all going to start, and it's going to go out from there. Now, we know that. But the Lord said something interesting. Sandy, you'll remember this. I say Sandy because he, he loves Bible prophecy and those kinds of things, and this is where this issue comes up. When the Lord is talking, I should have put it in my notes, but I thought, no, because we won't, we'll just go right over it. When the Lord says to that, when they start moving out, when they start moving out with this gospel, the Lord says, you will not have gone over all the cities of Israel until the Son of Man is come. Do you remember that, hearing that verse? Some of, the, some of you may remember that. In other words, he says, as you get ready, to fulfill this commission. You won't have gone to every city in the land of Israel. You won't have covered them before the Lord will have returned at His great and terrible day of the Lord. Now wait a minute. If, this, if they're not going... Now look, they got... I got to make a difference here. This has to make sense. At the midway point of Daniel's 70th week, when the abomination of desolation is set up, they're told to do what? Flee, right? And that believing remnant is going to get scattered. And he said, don't go back to your house to get your color TV and your computer and your, well, you know, get your stuff. Because your life is on the line here. You get out. As that believing remnant is scattered around the world, the Gentile nations are going to now, they're, going to, they're, they're either going to abuse and mistreat that remnant or they're going to receive them and they're going to protect them. And the way they're going to miss those judgments is by their treatment of that believing remnant. But when the time comes that they begin to discharge this gospel and it starts here and it starts to move out. He says, you won't have gone over all the cities of Israel until the Son of Man be come, which means that gospel won't go everywhere until the kingdom is established. And that's exactly what the Old Testament prophets said, that that gospel would go to the Gentiles once the kingdom was set up. So they're going to start this gospel, and you know who they're preaching to first? apostate Israel. They're trying to get them to believe the truth. And then the Lord will come back. He will set up that kingdom. And then, in continuation of that, that kingdom gospel is going to go forth to all the world. And when it does, it's going to have an impact upon all of them. So, here's what he says. Look at Luke 24. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning where? 
beginning at Jerusalem. Isn't that the same thing we saw in Acts 1? And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And you know what's happening during this extension of mercy in those first opening chapters of the book of Acts? Is they're beginning to discharge the commission that the Lord Himself had given them after His resurrection. We just read it in, in Mark 16. So they're beginning already to do that. Of course, then the program gets put on hold. All right. So it starts in Jerusalem and it moves out. Now, again, I've spent a little more time on this than I intended to. But when I gave you those three, when I gave you those three components of that climactic stage, just have that in your mind now. And let me show you that when, when this kingdom gets itself established and the nations around the world know what has happened here, the Lord has executed His wrath, there's been a resurrection, He has set up His kingdom, all of that has taken place. Now look what Isaiah, we, were in, we started this in Isaiah 60 last week, now I'm going to come back to that and I want to show you what's going to happen here. Oh, Acts 1.8, I was just showing you, that's the same thing that he was saying there in Luke 24. See, be preached in, uh, in his, among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And that's what Acts 1 8 says. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you. Be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. There's that progression again. Now, uh, Isaiah 60, verse 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. This is part of the glory that Israel is going to have out there in the kingdom. We saw the glory under David, and we saw the glory under Solomon, and now he's saying, when this kingdom gets set up, and a greater than Solomon is sitting on the throne, now you're going to see the sons of strangers are going to come and build your walls. Who are the sons of strangers? Yeah, that's Gentiles that are coming in from around the world. And not just them, but their rulers and kings shall minister unto thee. Look in verse 11. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. I talked about those forces of the Gentiles last week. Those are not military forces. That's, that's the, the wealth and the prosperity of the nations, the forces of the Gentiles are being brought in. Verse 12, For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. That is going to be the lot of anyone who decides that they're not going to be on board with this. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. The fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. Take a look now at verse 14. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. What does that mean, bending unto thee? Yeah, they're going to be bowing down. They're going to be, they're, they're, they're going to be prostrating themselves at the feet you know who he's talking to here? He's talking to Israel. And again, when I say that, I'm not talking about a bunch of unbelieving Jews. I'm talking about the believing remnant that has become that holy nation and royal priesthood. They're going to come bending the, unto thee. And all they that despise thee... See, this is part of that... Remember when I put up those, those three categories of blessing and that third one was national prosperity. And there was two elements to that. And the first one was all that material wealth that was pouring into the nation and we saw that. But the second part of that national prosperity was the fact that they were there was honor and just for me not coming up with a better word, a prestige in the mind of the Gentile nations about who these people are. They're looking at the nation of Israel and they're thinking, there is no nation like this. There's no people like this. There's no God like their God. 
Oh my goodness. Their, their, their knee-jerk reaction is, let us pour, give the very best that we have to these folks and, 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 and let's submit ourselves to them and recognize them for who they are. So when he says, and they that despise thee, and were th are they going to be despised? Are you kidding? They're going to be hunted down like animals. They that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. There's a difference, isn't it? And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. He's not talking about he's going to make them fake it. He's talking about that is the way they are now going to be looked at. And while the world under Solomon's reign, and I say Solomon instead of David because it just went to a zenith under Solomon, but under Solomon's reign, the rulers and, and people around the world, they came from everywhere to hear Solomon's wisdom and, 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 and to see the glory of God in the land, and they all went away amazed. Now the prophet is saying, but, but look, that didn't last long. That didn't last long. When Solomon, was, when his heart was carried away by those wives and concubines, all of that began to diminish, and pretty soon they were just like the other nations. Look, when you see what God was holding out for you, as great as that was, it was just the hem of the garment. And when you see how great that was, you've got to be thinking to yourself, Wow, what would it be like in the kingdom? If this is just the tip of the iceberg, what would it be like when the perfect Christ sits on the throne and establishes a righteous rule in Israel and gives them peace from their enemies, which is, by the way, those other three categories of blessing. They have rest from their enemies. They're not at war anymore. And... and, and when all of that is happening under Jesus Christ, how great will the kingdom be? Why would you want to be like the other nations of the world? See, that wouldn't make any sense. But that is exactly what was going on with them. So here he's talking about, this is what I'm going to do. We're reading the verses that are talking about what it's going to be like for them in the kingdom. You can take this chapter yourself and go on down through the chapter and see things like the curse is going to be lifted off the land. There isn't a nation in this world that has ever seen that. That's never happened before. Going to happen in the kingdom. And even though it looked like maybe Israel's fame and glory could not increase any more than it did under Solomon, it is going to make what happened with Solomon look like nothing in comparison uh, once the, the kingdom is established. Israel is going to be recognized as the head of all nations. As I was saying, the curse is not just going to be taken off the land, it's going to be taken off the animal kingdom as well. What do we have over there in Isaiah? The wolf lying down with the lamb, and the lion and the kid, which is, what, a little goat. A lion looks at that now and goes, oh, cabrito. <laughs> but in the millennium, it's, and it said the lion will eat straw like an ox. And a little child shall lead them. <sighs> Can you see parents looking at the kid? How many times have I told you not to bring that lion in here? Get it out of the kitchen. What are you doing? Get it off the sofa. There's nothing like an 800-pound lion laying on your sofa, right? This is the curse taken off of the animal kingdom. During that kingdom, the land is going to be the palatial residence of the monarch of the earth. 
the Messiah himself is going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to establish that righteous rule. We've mentioned that several times now. And this time, it's going to be a perfectly righteous rule. David established a righteous rule and Solomon continued it. But let me ask you a question. Was it perfectly righteous? It was not. And those men were not perfectly righteous. Neither one of them. So now let me bring you to the kicker of all this. Because when you get to Isaiah 64, he's going to make a statement. And when you read this, I'm betting it's going to ring a bell of remembrance with you about something Paul wrote to us in Corinthians. But he, remember who Isaiah is talking to. He is talking to the members of the believing remnant that are looking forward to that kingdom out there. So after he has talked about all of the things that are going to be, there's going to be peace, rest from their enemies. There's going to be a perfectly righteous rule. The Messiah is sitting on the throne of David. There's going to be national prosperity. The standard of living for everybody in the land is going to go up. And he says, and after all, and look, we didn't read it all, of course. But at the end, here's a statement that he makes. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. That's like at the end of everything he could say about how glorious the kingdom is going to be, he's going to say, from the very start of the world, nobody has ever seen anything or heard anything that will be the equivalent of what this kingdom is going to be. That, did that ring a bell with you? Is there a verse that you have heard before? Now, if you're the believing remnant, you've got to be saying, there has been some pretty astounding things that have happened in this world, not the least of which are recorded in this book about what happened to Israel during the reigns of David and Solomon. And if you're saying, it's really going to be so great that anything you've ever heard about or anything you've ever seen is not able to be compared with it. So now... Let me take you over to Corinthians. And I want to show you this. And by the way, remember what the Corinthians did. They turned back. They allowed some very smooth-talking agents of the adversary to talk them out of Paul's doctrine and convince them not to follow after Paul. So when Paul comes, and by the way, you know they're smooth talkers because look what Paul says about himself, and he's comparing himself to those guys. When he says this, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, hey, I, I wasn't this orator guy that came in and wowed you with my, my ability to speak. Look at this next verse. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Because that's what they had. Man's wisdom. And oh, it sounded good to the Corinthians. And they were so smooth at it. Look, people just bought into it. But in demonstration of the spirit and power. I'm going to show you how that happened, by the way. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Big difference. The Corinthians abandoned Paul's doctrine, and along with that, they quit their sonship lives. What they were really after is a life of ease and comfort. And, they, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you're making a decision about that instead of following your sonship life, that's an issue. Because what they really wanted to be is well thought of and well spoken of by the world. And their fellowship with the world around them was more important than them being the sons and daughters they had been called to be. The sufferings of Christ, they wanted no part of that. That was part of what the smooth talkers were talking about. 
They were saying, hey, you want to build this church up, you got to quit preaching this stuff. You got to, this stuff Paul's talking about, the sufferings and all that. Nobody likes to suffer. You got to quit talking about the sufferings. No, but you can't build a church on that. You, you're going to have to, you're going to have to start getting a, a positive message. And we have plenty of those today, don't we? So in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to write to them about the hidden wisdom. In verses 6 through 8, he's going to define what the hidden wisdom is. Because remember, Paul says, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but there is a wisdom he is going to be preaching, and he's going to call it a hidden wisdom. And he's going to talk about the revelation of the mystery revealing this hidden wisdom and how by doing that God took Satan in his own craftiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, and here's the verse that should have rang a bell with you. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now I've got to take a minute and on this verse because since we read it, didn't that sound a whole lot about what we just read back in Isaiah 64? Let me tell you, I, I know you can see it, but I just want to talk about it for a moment so that we really begin to let this soak in. As it is written. The word as, just like the word like, is a part of... Uh, <laughs> A part of speech, a smart of peach. It's a part of speech called a simile, and it, it means showing a comparison. If I say, ow, that's hot as fire, it doesn't mean it is fire. It means the heat is comparable. That's cold as ice. So when he says, as it is written, he's about to show you a comparison to something that was written before. We know where it is. It's in Isaiah 64. We just read it. But Paul changes it up just a little bit because he says, just like what Isaiah wrote back there in Isaiah 64, I could say a very similar simile a very similar thing to you about what's waiting for you as members of the body of Christ. So here's what he says to us. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man. So let's just take each one of those just individually just for a moment. And that is, and, and, and there's, I don't want to leave it right there, but let's just think about these individually. First of all, no one has ever seen anything that would cause them to understand what is waiting for you as an adopted son or daughter who is going to be laboring with their father in the heavenly places. Now, I'm putting all of that in there. We are aware of all of that. But I'm just saying, Paul is saying, no one has ever seen anything that would give them Listen to what he's saying. He's not saying you've never seen it. He's saying you have never seen anything that would cause you to understand what's waiting for you. Now Israel, did they see something? They did, didn't they? Then how is it in Isaiah the prophet would say, let me go back. He would say, for since the beginning of the world... Men have not heard what God's prepared for him that waiteth for him. Wait a minute, they did. And, and how can he say, uh, neither hath the eye seen? Did, they, did anybody in Israel see these things happen during the reign of David and Solomon? Well, if the. Seriously? My battery is dead, so it's going. Beep, beep, beep. Stop. Fine, it's driving me nuts. 
I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> they saw something. Well, why would the prophet come along and say, you haven't heard or seen anything that, about what God has prepared for you? What, how, in what way could he say that? Yeah. In other words, you saw this, but if that's all you saw and that's all you heard, you haven't seen it and you haven't heard it. Doesn't that make you, and if you actually knew about that, doesn't that make you go, wow, wow. Now Paul is going to come along and say, and by the way, our program's not the prophetic program. I guess I'll pick this back up after the break. But he's going to say, no one has seen it. There's not anything you've ever seen, and there's nothing you've ever heard. We'll talk about this. And there's nothing that's ever entered into the heart of man that would give you any idea of how glorious and how magnificent and how awesome a thing God has prepared for you. If you did, if you did, it would change the way you thought about everything. But you only get, let me, let, me, let me just show you the kicker and then we'll stop for the break. Let me br bring this back down to this verse. But never read verse 9 without reading verse 10. Because when I was being ordained, Here's what they said. They said, tell us, tell us what heaven's like. Well, I'm a young preacher boy, and I don't know much about anything, you know. I know I love Jesus, and I want to witness, and I, you know, but, you know, and I love the Word, but I, you know. And they said, tell us what heaven is like. But th there was about five of us that were, that were going through this. And so, anyway, they pointed at the first guy, and he goes... You know, his name was Steve Petty. Steve, tell us what heaven's like. And Steve goes, well, and I thought, thank God, I'm not the only one. And one of the deacons that was on the panel said, are you having a hard time coming up with something? And he said, yeah. And he said, that's okay, because the Bible says, I hath not seen, and ear hath not heard, neither hath entered in the heart of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love it. That was supposed to be like, yeah, we don't know anything about it. But if you read the next verse, it says, but, that's a corner word, isn't it? But God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. He has. You say, well, he hadn't revealed it unto me. Yes, he has. You say, well, I don't know it. That doesn't mean he didn't reveal it. It just means you weren't paying attention. Not you specifically, I'm just saying. That euphemistic who. Okay, so when we come back, I want to show you what he did reveal. Would you like to see that? That would be good to know about, wouldn't it? Since... I'm trying to draw a parallel issue here on the glory. I do, in Romans 9, 4, Paul is talking about Israel's glory. But I thought since we're talking about it, we ought to know something more about ours. So we'll get to do that when we come back from the break.